caffeinated and rehydrated, and perhaps you also had a cookie. A cookie. There are no cookies. I saw a cookie going around. Someone had a cookie. I wanted one, but I didn't get one. Next break. Yes, exactly. Next break. Next break, there will be cookies. Um, I am. I'm welcoming you to the panel discussion. Um, we have the Guidance Network collaborators here, uh, including myself, but I'd like to introduce you to a new face. We have the wonderful Dr. Imogen Aujla. She is a freelance dance psychology researcher, lecturer, and life and well-being coach. She has a PhD in dance psychology and diploma in cognitive and behavioral therapy. I just want to say, like, how exciting that there are so many dance psychologists in this room. Like, there are loads of them. Yay! What is that? Um, Imogen, yeah, huh? It is possible that there are these dance psychologist unicorns that are wandering around. Um, Imogen is, a passion, is passionate about the application of psychology to dance and runs a website called Dance in Mind to help anyone in dance learn more about psychology through blogs, worksheets, coaching, and mentoring. The website also features online courses for students, professionals, and freelancers on topics such as confidence, stress, and resilience, which use a mix of videos and worksheets based on research literature and CBT techniques. They're awesome. If you've never done them before, a couple of them are free. Um, worth doing, definitely. Um, alongside this work, Imogen is a regular guest tutor at the MAS Dance Science at the University of Bern, a peer mentor for the mental health charity Mind, and a member of the mental health advisory group of the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science. Imogen's research centers on psychological well-being, inclusion, talent development, inclusive dance, and working lives of freelancers. Research projects that may be of particular interest to delegates include what we call the CAT project, which was a three-year study of talent development among young people training at the Centers for Advanced Training in Dance. Projects exploring the working lives of freelancers and the challenges and benefits of freelance working. And a current project exploring racial equity and lack of representation in dance education. You can find more information on her website, danceinmind.org, or come and talk to her later. Welcome. Thank you so much, Imogen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this amazing event. Um, just to very quickly say um, thank you to Siobhan, and I know Erin said it before the break, but I'd like to just reiterate what a pioneer you are in doing this work. Um, the project that Erin referred to that we called the CAP project, no animals involved. Um, we were looking at talent development among young people aged 12 to 18. A lot of kind of issues and ideas around maturation came up, but we never really addressed it specifically. We, it's not something we were focusing on, but it kind of kept popping up. Um, and then when I was um, previously working at a university, I was so happy when Siobhan started publishing her work because I finally had some up-to-date information that gave a more balanced view about maturation, which is something that we just haven't really talked about. Maybe culturally as well, is it a British thing? We just don't talk about it and pretend it's not happening, but certainly in dance, I don't think we acknowledge it anywhere near enough. So it's so brilliant to be here today, and thank you to you, Siobhan, and all the partners for doing this work, because we do need to talk about it and to collaborate and discuss together and really think about how we can apply this brilliant research that's happening. Um, and also thank you to Peter and to Matthew on the video, because I also think when we start thinking about maturation in dance, I'm certainly guilty of this, I automatically think about girls and young women, but actually having the perspective of boys and young men is also equally important, so thank you for that as well. So I'm sure, like me, you've all got many ideas, thoughts, questions kind of floating around in your mind, so what this session is for is to have, we've got some set questions um, for the partners, and then there'll be time to open up to questions and comments um, from all of you. So to start with, our lovely panellists, can you please, uh, first of all, just Introduce yourselves briefly, tell us where you're from, how you got involved in the guidance project, and what are your key takeaways, your key perhaps learnings from being involved in this project? Should we go down the line in a really informal way? Okay, um, so I'm Erin Sanchez, I'm representing One.CK. UK. Our role within this project is really about helping the sector to know more about this area of work. 
So what do dance teachers know about this area? How can we raise awareness? But it's not just the dance teachers. And I'm really passionate about the ecological validity of this work in the sense that we're all, whether we're a teacher or a dancer or a student or a parent, a producer, a manager, a choreographer, someone who partakes in dance on a Saturday afternoon or goes to see Matthew Bourne in the theater, we are all influencing this ecology. And the more we all know about what dance is and what happens to dancers as a part of their processes of learning and development, the better this situation will be. And so One.CK, from that perspective, has committed to helping to essentially kind of be a loudspeaker for this work, making sure that it reaches people in whatever ways that it can. And I really hope that I can count on your support to be able to share this with the people that you know. Um, but also One.CK is about advocacy. So how can we advocate to government? How can we advocate to large organizations to provide the support that everyone in the ecology needs to be able to make these situations more effective, more supportive, more helpful for young dancers. Okay, um, I'm Siobhan, it's me again. Um, so I am a research fellow at the University of Exeter um, and have been trying to drive this, this bit of uh, work forward from a kind of research perspective. Um, I'm really just kind of trying to find the right collaborators who can actually make the change that I'm, I'm trying to go towards, like one UK, like the RID, um, you know, who can make change in education or advocacy and, and you know, across the sector. Um, in terms of my main takeaway from this work so far, um, I am hugely encouraged by all of you being here today and by the enthusiasm and dedication of all the people on the network, many of whom are completely just volunteering their time um, and expertise. So that really encourages me to, to kind of carry on with, with work in this space. Um, I think one of my kind of main positives from, from the whole thing was uh, doing the interviews with dance teachers and really listening to some examples of, of good practice in this space. There's nothing better than sitting in an interview with a dance teacher who is telling you they've gone and done this training and then they've changed this about their practice, they've changed something about their school. There is nothing better than that. And really, the guidance project is all about making more of that happen. So, yeah. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Angela Kirkham Ray, and I'm representing, in a way, the out-of-school settings, uh, recreational, although obviously, like most of you sat here, uh, we teach vocational exams. Um, I first got interested, involved, I came through to the old building uh, when Siobhan presented a um, training on this subject. and because we run a, a not-for-profit, inclusive school, and we have a lot of children of autistic, on the autistic spectrum, and we also have a community hub, which we teach dancing with Parkinson's, and dancing with the blind, and, and visually impaired, all sorts of community classes, as well as children. But I've always been passionate about the mental well-being of the children, uh, because to me that goes along with the physical changes that they find themselves in and um, so it was from receiving an email I think through RAD that would anybody like to be part of this that I got involved I just said yeah go on go for it <laughs> hello everyone my name is Max Ruswanda I represent the Royal Academy of Dance for this particular <coughs> event I'm a lecturer in teacher education and my, my role within the institution is to collaborate with my colleagues who are experts in dance education and see how a combination of my teacher education and their dance education specialists can prepare and train our dance teachers. And one of the reasons why I'm part and parcel of this project is that just to reiterate a point raised by Shibon a few moments ago. It's whereby you see research coming to influence the way you train teachers. Then afterwards, you want to see the effects of that combination when they go out and teach. And in addition to that, you also are trying to develop within them the ability to go, to go ahead and conduct research. 
And all this, when it's combined, the hope is it improves dense education. It enables us to understand the purpose of this gathering as much as possible. And I was talking to one of my former students who's sitting up there, and we're even sharing the idea of them doing research at undergraduate level directly related to this project. And the moment they do that, and the moment we motivate them through such gatherings, we start developing researchers. People end up joining people like Chibol and the Imogen over there, and then they continue developing. So my big takeaway from this gathering is to learn as much as possible from you, that if you do a project like this one, how do you see it influencing the training programs? And how do you want us to ensure that those training programs, they don't remain purely theoretical, they make relevance to varied teaching context. And when our students, when they've graduated, when they join you, at least they come more prepared and we benefit from their experience and the cycle continues. And I hope we manage to do part two with our gathering this afternoon. Thank you. My name is Tabitha. I am part of the Student Advisory Network. Um, I actually trained on one of the CAP programs, so again, it's really interesting to hear about the research and the link in with this project. And then went to Vocational Buy School in 2018. Um, I heard about the project from, I think it was a call out online about students who had been um, in training in the last five years. And I kind of have had a bit of a, a varied journey into kind of dance, dance research and dance science and now work in mental health and well-being. So I kind of wanted to be able to, um, I suppose, kind of learn more about the um, way in which Siobhan's research was informing kind of current practice and helping teachers um, and also kind of, I suppose, reflect and bring some of my experiences from training into this as well. Um, I had like some kind of fantastic times in training but also kind of really struggled in terms of being a late kind of maturer and um, kind of had a, yeah kind of quite a lot of difficulties kind of leaving training and kind of learning about the impact that growing up in dance has had on kind of how I see myself and kind of mental health and things like that so I think having done a lot of learning in like the last four or five years it felt like a really valuable time to be able to bring some of that in and help inform um, yeah, practice and research and the kind of difference that teachers can make when working with young people and adolescents. For me, the biggest takeaway has been this kind of collaboration between the student advisory group and teachers and researchers. I think so rarely we get to have these dialogues where students are involved. There's unfortunately that kind of, you know, you just kind of get told what to do or you don't get to fully understand the rationale behind why things are done the way they're done. It just is. So being able to you know, be really proactively involved and invited to be involved in these discussions and in these processes has been um, just like a really nice way to kind of wrap things up for myself but also to see where things can go in the future. So, yeah. Thank you everyone. Um, I think what's, what's really striking about this project actually, just, just hearing your experiences and sort of thinking what I know about it as well, is that it, it is a truly holistic project. You know, we're, we're thinking about the physical and the psychological effects of maturation. We're thinking about how we can use that knowledge to inform practice. Those things are all working hand in hand. And then having collaboration with students, with teachers, with the people involved, rather than the researchers being here and the dancers being over here, which is how research is often conducted, that that knowledge is equally valued and shared, I think is also really important and is how, in my opinion, research should be moving forward. So that's really wonderful. Okay, so what do you think are the key issues in this area in terms of teacher training? Um, education and practice as well. It's quite a big question, isn't it? Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I, can't. I think there are a number of key issues. I think one of them, if you've been involved in teacher training, is to make sure that you pick the academic standards which you think are quite suitable and relevant to your students so much that whatever they learn, they'll put into practice as much as possible. And with the specific purpose of this particular project and what has happened so far, it's indicating quite clearly that we're not covering much in terms of growth and maturation. So what it means for people who are involved in teacher training, for example, is for you to go back, reflect, look at what you've been teaching so far, and say to yourself, 
with this piece of research in front of us, can we use it as a reflection of what we are doing and how we can improve as much as possible? Then I think you can even go a bit further. If you could also talk to your former students, just find out what, whatever you are covering, how far did it manage to assist them, or how much is it assisting them, we can go by with their careers as much as possible. So I think that could be a key issue, which is so important for us, for example, if you're training. Um, for me, uh, you know, getting anything out of it, well, I, I learned so much on that initial coming down to London uh, with Siobhan, and it really uh, opened my eyes as much that I felt I could pass on to my teachers. Being a life member of RAD, obviously, been teaching many years, and I think the teaching has changed from having a cane or <laughs> not that <there. laughs> But um, my youngest daughter went to Royal Ballet School. She's now senior ballet mistress with the Royal Ballet Company. And I sat and watched the change through the years, plus students, pupils that were there before Sam. And you can see the changes, and they're, they're good changes, but um, my students that have fairly recently uh, trained here at RAD, when I talk to them, that they're out there now in the, in the world, and, and a few years prior to, you know, not fairly recently, but a lot of them out there teaching, and I questioned them before I started being on this panel, uh, advisory group and they hadn't a clue really what I was talking about and it was like well we know how to teach a part of sharp so that's fine um, and they now know because I've passed every bit of information and I think we're all here because you're all interested my worry is the older teachers, and I'm really sorry because I've been teaching over 50 years, but the older teachers, where are they, the, the, the stuck in the mud teachers that actually don't believe in this or there's no time to do it? And I think we're all responsible for, um, you know, what Siobhan has, has passed on to us all uh, for the well-being and, and learning about how young people's bodies change and how they deal with it. And how are we dealing with it? To, you know, one teacher saying something could la negative, you know, could last the lifetime. And I think it's scary, but, you know, especially nowadays you can be sued for this, that, and the other. But it is scary. But our job is to nurture them, and, and they can all go home and uh, maybe get careers or it, not necessarily in the industry, but. It's going to be with them the rest of their life. And I think this is where, you know, we're all here because you're interested. And that, my takeaway is keep up the good work because it's wonderful. I think in terms of, like, I don't know all the ins and outs about the teacher training side of things, but I think that as someone who's kind of on the receiving end of it, I think the difficulty is the application of it sometimes. So, you know, you'll get going to the CP or you'll do the training, but then where there maybe isn't the guidance or for the teachers themselves, there's that kind of disconnect in terms of how to actually apply what they know into that environment. I think in the, in the slides earlier they were talking about how you, know, you kind of know the information about puberty or you can kind of know the best practice, but then actually applying it in context in the sort of dance world that doesn't, um, yeah, that, that doesn't favour that, almost, almost kind of encourages it the other way. I think you're almost stuck sometimes in that sort of impossible situation where that culture just doesn't encourage that to, to fit and to sit nicely or to let it develop. So I think that, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that application stage of it, I think, in terms of the training and, yeah, actually seeing a difference, there's, that would be where I would say there's that kind of big issue. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the, I don't know, kind of messages and stuff that we receive, so much of it is still informed by hearsay and myth and just the sort of kind of traditionalistic approach that you know maybe their dance teachers kind of come into those sessions and that's still in their back of their minds that's still the kind of backlog of information they have they hear this in that session and then yeah actually employing it i think is a really kind of difficult um yeah it's a real kind of challenge for them and i think those kind of next steps you know i think 
in terms of enforcing the change, it was that kind of relay race. We're doing the first and second hand, you know, students are speaking up, there's people like Siobhan and Erin and we're doing all kind of informing and providing the, the knowledge and the research, but the, the handover, that kind of third and fourth leg of the teachers actually putting it in, I don't think we're always kind of there yet. So I think that's the real kind of next challenge for that training, the actual kind of application of that knowledge into those training environments. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that in terms of that being a really key place for us to, to really focus and that's what Imogen and I will be discussing in, in the workshop um, in a moment. But yeah, it's, it's kind of doing that work around what are the mechanisms, the tools, the support that, that take us uh, from that knowledge to translating that knowledge. How do we evolve past that point? Um, but I also uh, believe there's an awful lot more to do before that point. I mean, we have increased um, access and you know opportunity in, in terms of providing this training, um, but there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of more widely recognising this as a core pillar of dance teacher training. You know, at, at the core of, of what dance teachers do, they're working with developing minds and bodies, and so this, for me, really should should be completely central to that, and it should not be a kind of an add-on, something that we do CPD for. It should be very much central to you know our core teacher training. Yeah, and I think probably building on that, the idea that dance teachers have to do so many things. You have to have pedagogical knowledge. You have to have anatomical and physiological knowledge, you have to understand psychology, you have to also understand development, you need to understand how to manage conflict, you need to be a business owner, you need to be economically savvy, I mean like the number of things that you have to be able to hold is huge and many people are working as sole traders so they're doing that on their own and I think the other thing that's really important for me and a key issue about teacher training in this area is the economic pressure on dance teachers right now to make their businesses economically viable following the pandemic and the current economic situation, there is a massive pressure on you to train as many students as you can and take as many students as you can through exams and have positive outcomes for all of them, not only psychologically, but also in terms of their physical capabilities and their exam scores. And it's just enormous. And I think that that pressure leads to this sort of lack of uptake of CPD, maybe it also leads to fears and concerns around even approaching these topics because I don't want to approach it because I don't want to like set it off in the student and make it worse. Um, I have parents who are concerned about this and I don't know how to manage that. There's a lot of pressure on dance teachers. And I think the other thing that's really present for me about teacher training with regard to this topic is that Politically right now, dance in education, dance funding is so at risk. And we are all fighting our own battles on our own fronts to make sure that we can argue for the value of dance in society in our local communities and more broadly. And I think that when we're thinking about the context of all these pressures on dance teachers and the political kind of devaluing of dance, we don't want to be seen as the bad guy. We don't want to do anything wrong, but we also don't know what to do that's right. And so I think that initial teacher training can be that, that hand of help, that initial kind of connection to go, okay, we can do something about this. It's not so scary, and we're not alone. I think as well, just to pick up on and you last, that last word you used, like not feeling alone, and I know that a lot of private dance studio teachers often also feel quite isolated. You know, they're always busy and they're always with their students, but they're not necessarily with peers. So, or if you're a freelancer, you go to one job, you do your thing, you disappear, go off, push off to the next thing. You're not talking to a team about, oh, what should we do about so and so? I'm not sure about this this issue or topic. You just have to keep, you just have to keep going. And actually, we've also got to think about. That, that I think what we call it having the sort of the handover of the information. We can't just say, teachers, here you go, we did this, now you go and do something with it, in addition to all of the other things that you know you're, you're meant to do. Is actually how do we assist with that process of well let's let's work together and figure it out instead of just again it being well, well we did this thing and now we're giving you the information. You're welcome. It should never, you know, sort of feel like that. It needs to be something that's delivered in a collaborative way. So thank you. So Thinking about kind of looking forward then, 
the final question before we open to the floor. What would you like to see going forwards? And it might be something that's kind of the small scale next step in your practice, or it might be the long term big vision, blue sky kind of thing you'd like to see across the sector. And um, what do you think needs to change so that we can support young people in dance using this amazing knowledge that we're, we're gaining today? Um, and give kind of leadership and voice to these things. What happens next? <laughs> No pressure. And we won't hold you to any of this, by the way. We'll say, oh, two years ago, you said you were going to do this. <laughs> I could kickstart the response. I think we need to look carefully at our CPD courses and make sure they are worth it. Because when you look at some of the feedback we got from the participants, once of sessions are not quite effective for them. I think people need to sit down, think carefully and intelligently and how we set up our CPD courses so that people are already practicing in the sector. They get better feedback for such topics where they go, come in, pay some money for it, spend a bit of money with us, but we must come up with something which needs to be relevant and sensitive to their needs. We need to revolutionize CPD. That would be my first comment. I think the next comment is when it comes to teacher training, it always goes in cycles. And we need to continue maintaining these cycles. And for this particular cycle, we need to look back and say, how much are we covering in terms of growth and maturation as we train these young ladies and these young gentlemen to go out and teach? And then we just need to be, I think, as, as objective as we can and make clear distinctions and decisions that we need to improve or we need to make all these changes. There's need for change. I think that's the bottom line message here. We can't keep it as it is. Because at the end of the day, we still remain disconnected in such a way that people do whatever they want to do and then we continue doing these research, pieces of research. The pieces of research need to stay on our desks and applied by everyone involved as much as possible. And my last comment is maybe related to what Peter said. I think we also as teachers, we need to look back and say, do we have a phobia towards dance science? Do we have a phobia towards doing any research related to anything which is so technical, somewhere that you find it very difficult to do so. And I think part of the message we are trying to share today is that we do it collaboratively. We don't have to be a dense science specialist, but we can still make a contribution. Thank you. Can I pick up on that last bit about collaboration? I think that's so important. I think we really are in such a strong position, and I think Siobhan's work is really a, a, such a great example of this, to bring people together so that everyone can contribute where they have knowledge and understanding and can learn from others. Um, I'd also say that a really important next step for me is that everyone in the sector is given the support that they need personally and professionally to be able to work well. And I mean work well in the sense that you are able to feel safe, confident, comfortable, and healthy in the work that you're doing. And I think for all the reasons that I stated previously and other things that have come up on the panel, there are lots of people who aren't working well right now. Um, but I think the other side is that we all need to examine how, how we support wellness in others. And I think that that is a learning area. We can learn that through CPD. We can pick up knowledge and information about you know, developmental growth and well-being. But how can we invest in others collaboratively? Because I think that piece of the puzzle is really difficult. Um, how, do we, how do we know? Well, we can't know everything. We have to rely on others. But we can work together to build that wellness and support wellness across our, our ecology. Um, I agree. I have three kind of key things that I want to say about this. So the first one is that we've kind of started a dialogue on this and we've got some momentum and it's really a call to action for everybody in the room and everyone that you know in this space to really support us to continue to drive this forward. We realise that we're probably sort of preaching to the converted today. You all came here because you think this is interesting and relevant and important, um, but there's an awful lot of people who still don't. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge that we have in order to actually change something. We need buy-in from across the sector and we, yeah, <laughs> we need, I think that good teacher training will underpin that change and I think it's a really core part of that. But um, 
yeah, I think we really need everyone here to tell everyone else about what's going on and really encourage others to, to kind of support this work. Um, and my last thing that I want to say is, um, again, a little bit of a call to action. If anyone's interested in research in this space, we just need more going on and we need more interest and, you know, if anyone's interested, please do talk to me. I think, you know, there's just so much work to do um, and it's a really exciting space to be in. For me, we recently talked about it. It's majority, I would imagine, of um, you guys here uh, as an out of school setting is the government guidelines that are guidelines. And I think um, that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks because there are, I know, many teachers, they might not have even looked at. Um, the out of school settings government guidelines and there are very few legal requirements in this uh, they've just updated it this, this month very few and I think the battle is if they're just guidelines uh, who's going to think oh well I don't need to bother that um, you know bother with that I, I make, make sure that you know our mental health first aider that's all I am, I'm not an expert, but I made sure for young people uh, and also adult first aid of mental health for the teachers. Because, you know, they go through an, an awful lot of worry, anxiety and so on. But I think while the government as well has still got, this is our advice, not a legal requirement, then a lot of teachers, and can understand, especially if they're on their own, think, well, that's fine, I don't really need that, I haven't got time. But I think we need to change that, say, well, it is important, and there might just be guidelines, but, you know, do you not all realise um, this, that, and the other? And, and moving forward, if, the, you know, those will be stuck now, those government guidelines, because they're only just brought a new updated version, so it's up to us to get out there and say, right, you know, we, this is important. There's so much there. That's my moving forward. <laughs> yeah, I think the last thing I would kind of want to say is as well about kind of feedback. Like, how do we know that our efforts are working and are making a difference? So, you know, I know we've talked in our kind of discussions about how we get that feedback from teachers about CPD, but I think also, you know, in terms of student feedback as well, you know, those are the individuals who are primarily being uh, affected and impacted by their, those teaching practices. So, you know, it would hopefully be just not the absence of kind of you know, horror stories, and it would be how do we get that feedback from students, from teachers, you know, ideally continuing that collaborative work to then develop and you know, change things that aren't working kind of proactively and, um, you know, develop the things that are, change things, challenge things. I think it also has to be, you know, this kind of continuous loop of things going on so that we move forward and so that we do know, you know, that, that, difference, is, that difference is being made and we're hearing from the people who are being directly impacted by it, but those who are delivering that teaching as well. Because I know in terms of, well, especially the things that everyone was saying about access to teaching CPD and access to, um, to that knowledge and how it is then, yeah, kind of practice and how it's inputted into those environments. I think in order for us to know that it's valuable and that it is working, that idea of feedback has to be really secure as well. Oh, thank you. What a lot of food for thought. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm sure we all have lots of things we're thinking about now. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments?
thoughts on that? Um, from a regulatory perspective, I think you can talk about carrots and sticks, right? I think that we need both. I think we need a regulatory structure that clearly marks out what information, what education, what certifications and knowledge people need to be able to be effective in this environment. And I think that that can be through a variety of different means. Um, UK Sport has a really interesting regulatory structure. If any of you have children or know any children who do any sport almost except for things like martial arts, they will have a, a coach who will have to have certain CPD, certain qualifications, certain training. That kind of a structure could be implemented in dance. Um, a more robust structure could be like the structure that teachers in schools have. Um, some of you may have a teacher uh, school uh, qualification, may understand these, these structures. That's much more robust, much more kind of black and white. Um, we could go either way. That would be the stick approach. The carrot approach, I think, is what you're talking about with social, social stigma. And I think we can use that approach as well, but I think one thing that I would kind of caution about social stigmatizing of this kind of information is that there is a cycle of victimhood. And I mean that in the sense that we all grew up. If you think for a moment about what your experiences were personally growing up, for me, when I reflect upon it, I sort of had this like dark box between about 11 and about 16, where I just don't want to think about what my psychological health, my physical looking like was, because it was so difficult. It was incredibly traumatic. But I think those of us that came through a dance experience, I mean, we've heard some of the, the things that have happened to some people here in this room. Some of those experiences weren't all that great. And if we are recreating those experiences or we're, we're unintentionally placing those kinds of experiences on others, um, there may be a lack of self-reflection there, there may be a lack of training that needs to be addressed. And I think if we stigmatize people for that, I think that can be really problematic for people's health and well-being, but also for our own responsibility to make sure that people are well-trained. So my argument would be we need a structure, we need regulation and law, not just guidelines, but I think we also need positive social messages around this, you know, reminding people what it's like to grow up and helping them to remember what, what it was like being 12 or 13 and being in front of a mirror all day and wearing you know, form-fitting clothing and trying to navigate the physical and psychological differences that occur. It starts right from the little ones. You know, at each school, each teacher, if they have the school has a policy um, of mental health and well-being and, and looking after, and then those t tiny tots they grew up they through the school, feeling more secure in how they look, feeling um, they're not odd, and they, you know, let's face it recreational, you've got children of all abilities, all bodies, and you know, it, it's not like a vocation full-time training. And I know even with my seniors, those that have the ballet bodies, um, you know, their friends in class look at them and know they're looking, things like that. But I think also, as an example, I just had a, a grade eight young lady who is a very big girl. Uh, big enough that her mum's had to spend £50 on a support bra. I, I don't mean that unkind, I'm just trying to uh, uh, explain. And she wasn't going to do a grade 8 because she looks awful, she looks terrible. But at the same time, she's also got that little bit, well, why am I here? Why am I still loving my grade 8? And I am capable. And she, she managed to get her high merit, and that was fantastic. But that, other children looking to her, to, to India, you know, that they, they say, oh, I'm okay, she got a great day, I can do this. And I think a lot of it, you know, we all have to uh, look at it like that and, and not just, oh, you know, they've all got to have the, this, the ballet body and, and so on. And I think it does start, they see uh, older ones and it's how the teachers 
encourage that and nurture that. Because it doesn't mean to say because you've got a bigger body, you're happy, you're no good at dancing. You could be beautiful, absolutely stunning. So to me, it's start you know, from the, the roots and, and keep it going throughout the school. I mean, I've taught for 40 years, once a week I was in a town not far from here. And, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've taught for 40 years in a town near here, and we teach once a week as all shapes and sizes, right up through to the week school. And I think as a teacher, you sort of sense when the girl comes and she don't want to take off her t-shirt or she wants to wear shorts. And we have a very relaxed view about the uniform. We have a uniform, but if a girl comes in her shorts, and that's fine, if she wants to wear her baggy t-shirt, that's fine. Because it's about, as you said, their well-being, going out to the class, having had a good time, because then they'll come up the next week. If they don't enjoy it, they may to feel uncomfortable, they won't. Um, I think uh, we, we have on our website a policy about uniform, but we're not as teachers, as a group, we are, I'm a group of teachers, we don't, we're not half and fast. Because you can't be, you know, you know, they go through phases, and then after their growth spurt, and after they grow up a little bit, they come up the other end, and they start accepting their body shape, and they're happy, because to me, all of them are, are lovely. And that's it. as a teacher, that, that environment has got to be right. I'm quite lucky in a way, I haven't got a wall that has mirrors. And, and I think a good teacher can teach children correctly without having to see their body in there. You have to help them find the correct place And I, I think that to, that's been an advantage to me. And also think we ought to think about the motivation of why do they want to come to dance. Not all of them want to do exams. Not all of them want to perform. Um, sometimes it's mum actually wants to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my philosophy in my school is let's have happy children and let's also teach the correct technique. Having been an RAD person all my life, um, I'm now sort of semi-retired, but I believe in qualifications. But unfortunately, many of the teachers in my town are not qualified. They've probably done a weekend course um, teaching, I don't know what, and then they set up. They last five minutes, I know, but you know, they then do the damage or they upset children. I hear all sorts of stories, this teacher told my daughter she's ugly, you know, the lot. And I just feel you're right, that we've got to promote good practice and good well-being and understanding. If we do, we will keep our businesses and they will grow. And actually, just to say your point about mirrors, I remember the university I used to teach in the day we got mirrors, uh, sorry, curtains put over the mirrors. I think everyone, yeah. students and staff, we all went, oh, <laughs> collective sigh of relief. Everyone just felt so much better. And there was actually research about when there aren't mirrors in studios, when you can wear you know, loose fitting clothes, your body image tends to be better, actually. So I think those kinds of things are relatively easy to implement, actually, if you're thinking about kind of initial steps. We've had a question here and then here. Um, I've got a few things I want to say, but I'll just have to do one quick question. Um, I think, is there an ambition to uh, extend some of the research with young dancers beyond the ballet setting? Because I think, you know, I come to lots of these things and I love this work and I'm passionate about it, but, and you even said in your presentation, you know, it's, it's in a ballet world. Why is it still only in the ballet world? is my question and is there an ambition to move that into a multidisciplinary 
uh, setting, and if so, let's talk about that. Um, and then also just an acknowledgement that some of the potential damage and language that can be used towards young dancers is not only coming from teachers. The dance competition scene in this country is exploding and it's everywhere. And um, I'm an adjudicator for All England Dance and Federation Festivals, but I'm aware that there's a huge uh, commercialised part of that competition world that has even less <laughs> kind of guidelines than, than those areas. Um, and, and I suppose I don't even think there's an answer to it yet, but can we have a conversation about how we access that world because that world is filled with young and ambitious teachers and and filled with people who have uh, a status and a voice and a platform to address lots of young people and that needs to be thought about i don't know if there's any answers to any of that just they're just two good things that are at me at the moment yeah, okay, so the first one, uh, with regard to the research, yes, we are hyper aware that what we've done so far is very ballet centric and it really was part of a, okay, you know, starting from what very little we knew it, it was in that context and, and to kind of grow and develop it from there. Um, but yes, the next phase of this, at least in, in my plans and in the sort of proposals that I've half written at the moment, um, is to take this much broader. Um, I have a collaboration with the ISTD and it's, it's finding the right collaborators who can help us to move this out um, beyond just ballet. Um, because yeah, absolutely, that's, that's what we want to do. We want this to be kind of dance sector wide um, and we don't want to just consider young people who are in ballet training. So yes, it is the plan and anyone who has connections or would like to contribute to, to that, um, yeah, please speak up. and. With regard to the second question, someone else can probably answer better than I can. But yeah, I think again, for me, that comes back to collaborate. So we can find people from that world, if you like, people who are willing to engage with us and you know take it forward. That that's what we need. We need them to engage, and then we can start to kind of yeah work from there, rather than kind of coming in and being like, oh, there's a problem here. Kind of you know starting from a different kind of. I also jump in and ask, what about post-18 as well? Because Erin and I were talking about this the day, how when students would come to university, we were always very kind of conscious of, or maybe it's your first time living away from home, so we're here for you. And, but then put them in the studio, we treat them like they're fully formed, you know, dancers and adults, and that's, you know, I knew that wasn't true, but it, I, I can't say I really thought about it when I was teaching technique. And is there kind of a sense that there's also expansion all, in all ways? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a something that's come up a lot in our conversations, hasn't it, as well, the university uh, context for that. And so, yeah, absolutely. Again, for us, it's about finding people who want to collaborate with us in that space and, and trying to move forward from there. But yeah, it, we want to go in all directions with this, but we just uh, need more arms and legs. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, my um, question really um, may be unanswerable, so I apologise <laughs> for that. But I was just wondering whether anybody had a strong sense, whether it's you guys on the panel or anybody in fact in the room, had a strong sense about what does success look like? Mm -hmm. And do we need to think about what success looks like in the grassroots space differently to what success looks like in the vocational space? Because that's two very different types of experience. Um, and my thoughts in the vocational space had gone along the lines that if we were successful about making this understanding a pillar of dance teacher training, that vocational training would change. To go right back to your very first research, because essentially that's what we're doing. We're doing training in the vocational space that's not suited to a body that's going through maturation of compared to changes. Yeah, I mean, others probably know more than me in this space, but a big thing that came out, so as part of my PhD, I spoke to um, adolescents in dance and I also spoke to professional dancers, and a huge theme was the sort of 
advocating for, for later specialisation. And from lots of different perspectives, the kind of core thing that came out really was around this idea of not growing up so much in a bubble. You know, when we think about perceptions of a right and wrong way to grow, that all these kinds of things. The wider your reference group is, kids you go to normal school with, kids you go to ballet with, the wider your reference group is, the healthier you should need that kind of idea of what you know you should look like when you go through puberty or whatever um, is. So yeah, I agree. I think that what we know, I know we don't know that much, and <laughs> we always want more data and we always want to know more, uh, for me, it's, it's enough to say that we, we do need to change things. And it has started in terms of places like the Royal Valley School at least engaging in, in this kind of work um, and thinking about it. Um, but for me, I think I'd be a little more radical. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. I have a thought. Um, I think success looks like body inclusion across the breadth and depth of dance in the sense that it doesn't matter what your physical form is everybody dances and unfortunately we have this very narrow slice and this is true of lots of different genres but the criteria are different for those different genres this narrow slice of what's right and I think the rightness is, it's just a false, a false narrative. And for me, I will feel like we're successful in this work when that false narrative isn't there. And that when you go and see a dance performance, when you go and participate in your local dance class, and there will, would be dance classes for every age, because right now I'm really aware that there's this big gap between children and young people and older adults, you know, like, if you're my age, there's no dance class for you. Hello? Rude. But, like, I feel like that would be, you would see the entire breadth of society in those experiences. Mm Really. <laughs> so, really, what I'm saying is, how do you, what do you respond to that? 
I try my best to word it the best way I can, but I want them to never come in with that mindset. How am I to battle as one single person of culture that they're seeing not just in dance but everywhere? I listen to the pop music and I hear pop stars singing about how they're struggling with their body image issues. And it's just everywhere. How do you combat cultures as a one single person in their life that they see for maybe five hours a week maximum? And yeah, that is it. I've got one more minute left. So I would just like to say you're powerful because they ask you. You are important. You may, oh, they may only be with you for one hour a week, but they ask you that question because they want the answer from you. That gives you their privilege and the power to influence them really strongly and positively. Yeah. Well, I never tried to ask the question because it's any of those questions, not once in my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad they can help me, but it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for you. You've got to deal with that, you, in your own way. Did we have one more yeah. question just up there? <laughs> <laughs> and you're teaching them to you know kind of advocate for themselves and also to be comfortable with their bodies you're doing more than you think you are for setting them up to, to be more secure in that harsher environment I don't know anyone else up a lot of emotion in me. It makes me feel really angry. 
because that transition that happens between pre-vocational or, or participatory settings and vocational dance happens when these people are children. Mm -hmm. They are never over the age of 18 when they're making that transition. And when, when I think about having to prepare a child to be able to cope with someone making an abusive comment to them about their body or about anything else, it just makes me rage because that is not the industry I want to be a part of. And I, I deeply believe that we need to prepare people to be able to manage challenge because challenge is a part of life. Part of what's so beautiful about dance is that we teach young people to develop skills of self-awareness and, and resiliency and joy and passion, all those things that are going to help them navigate challenges in their life, are transferable skills. But I do not want those children to be taught those things in order to wear an armor for an industry which is abusive. That is not okay with me. And I would prefer that we, rather than putting our efforts and our energies into armoring our young people, we put our efforts and our energies into changing this so that it isn't a place where people need to wear armor to be able to survive. And I, I totally understand the perspective that you're at, but like I just... Yeah, that's no time. Definitely. That's the real world now, but we professional schools. workshop two, which is in a studio just behind us. Ah, yes. So workshop one is uh, with Siobhan and with the lovely Imogen Knight, um, and they're going to be talking about dance teachers' experiences and... Translating practice. knowledge to practice. Translating yeah. knowledge to practice. And 
Maxwell and I are going to be doing workshop two, which is about teacher training and the content of that. How do we kind of improve the content of teacher training overall? Thank you.